information to an employer, for example, without your permission. And if you'd like to know who has seen your health information, you have the right to get a report. That's called an accounting of disclosures. HIPAA gives you the right to say how you want to be contacted. For example, you can tell your provider what phone number they should call to contact you and whether they can leave a message. HIPAA also gives you the right to request that your information not be shared with certain people or organizations. All these rights are spelled out in the Notice of Privacy Practices, which is usually given to you or posted at your doctor's office or hospital. Be sure to read this notice carefully. It lets you know exactly how your information will be used and shared and how your rights are being protected. And lastly, if you think any of these rights have been violated, you have the right to file a complaint. We're serious about working with you to protect your health information. Know your rights. To get started, just visit the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights at hhs.gov OCR. Your health information, your rights. Whether your health information is stored on paper or electronically, you have the right to keep it private. Those rights are protected under a law known as HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA gives you important rights. First off, you have the right to see or get a copy of your medical records. Sometimes you might not be able to see certain parts of the full record, but you always have the right to ask. If you find a mistake in your record, you have the right to request to have it corrected. If you disagree with your doctor or health plan about certain information in your record, you have a right to submit a written statement of disagreement that will be kept with your record. You also have the right to know how your health information is used and shared. Now, your provider is allowed to share your information for certain reasons without asking you first, like when your doctors work together to determine how to best treat you when you're sick, or to report the flu when it's in your area. But in general, your providers can't give information to an employer, for example, without your permission. And if you'd like to know who has seen your health information, you have the right to get a report. That's called an accounting of disclosures. HIPAA gives you the right to say how you want to be contacted. For example, you can tell your provider what phone number they should call to contact you and whether they can leave a message. HIPAA also gives you the right to request that your information not be shared with certain people or organizations. All these rights are spelled out in the Notice of Privacy Practices, which is usually given to you or posted at your doctor's office or hospital. Be sure to read this notice carefully. It lets you know exactly how your information will be used and shared and how your rights are being protected. And lastly, if you think any of these rights have been violated, you have the right to file a complaint. We're serious about working with you to protect your health information. Know your rights. To get started, just visit the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights at hhs.gov OCR. Your health information, your rights. Whether your health information is stored on paper or electronically, you have the right to keep it private. Those rights are protected under a law known as HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA gives you important rights. First off, you have the right to see or get a copy of your medical records. Sometimes you might not be able to see certain parts of the full record, but you always have the right to ask. If you find a mistake in your record, you have the right to request to have it corrected. If you disagree with your doctor or health plan about certain information in your record, you have a right to submit a written statement of disagreement that will be kept with your record. You also have the right to know how your health information is used and shared. Now, your provider is allowed to share your information for certain reasons without asking you first, like when your doctors work together to determine how to best treat you when you're sick or to report the flu when it's in your area. But in general, your providers can't give information to an employer, for example, without your permission. And if you'd like to know who has seen your health information, you have the right to get a report. That's called an accounting of disclosures. HIPAA gives you the right to say how you want to be contacted. For example, you can tell your provider what phone number they should call to contact you and whether they can leave a message. HIPAA also gives you the right to request that your information not be shared with certain people or organizations. All these rights are spelled out in the Notice of Privacy Practices, 
which is usually given to you or posted at your doctor's office or hospital. Be sure to read this notice carefully. It lets you know exactly how your information will be used and shared and how your rights are being protected. And lastly, if you think any of these rights have been violated, you have the right to file a complaint. We're serious about working with you to protect your health information. Know your rights.
Time is six o'clock, and we are beginning our briefing session, working briefing session, if you will. And uh, just for a note, uh, Mr. Harvey has notified us he is on the way, and he will be here as soon as he can. Uh, one note of housekeeping for everyone, please. There are two things on the agenda tonight. There is a special proclamation, and there is also a recognition by me as champions of the city. And those particular individuals that are coming for those two things are coming specially for that. So they're arranging their time because they're scheduled to be here somewhere around 7, I told them. So as we get into our agenda, and if you see that executive session needs to be placed at the end of our meeting tonight, we will do that in deference to our guests that are coming for the 7 o'clock time. So if you keep in mind of that, we'll keep it on time. And also, as Mr. Uh, Hager has received toward that executive session, whether we do it uh, in, in the order as we have it, or if we need to change the order to put it toward the end of this, our particular meeting. So thank you very much for your consideration with that. Okay, uh, work session and briefing time. We go first, item number one, to interim city manager, Mr. Brown. Uh, consent items, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the first item is uh, consent agenda item A, consider approval of draft city council meeting minutes for the special fall city council meeting on May, excuse me, on March 14th, 2023. Consent agenda item B, uh, consider an ordinance amending chapter 19, traffic article 1 in general, section 19-1, definitions by adding a definition of oversized vehicles, by amending chapter 19, traffic article 6, stopping, standing, and parking, by amending section 19-115, standing or parking of trucks, tractors, trailers, and commercial vehicles, by amending section 19-116, no parking and or placement of oversized vehicles, storage units, cargo containers, recreational vehicles, and through streets by adding sections B and C and the amount of parent subsection B to subsections D. And Chief Levigity is here. He'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, this is an item that has been presented to the council previously. And uh, in our packet, the changes were highlighted, and anything that needed to be blocked out was uh, scripted as such, and in terms of a knockout, anything else added is in yellow. Uh, any other questions, comments? It was, there were significant changes to it, but as I recall, all of those changes have been incorporated now for something that we had discussed as council previously. Uh, so any questions, comments, Chief, in terms of this? If not, we will proceed further. Uh, thank you, Chief and staff, uh, all of the staff in law enforcement and ordinance is working on this one. Thank you for all your input on that one. I know that it took some time to pull this one together and in reading it. Enforcement is up to y'all. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Okay, thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Uh, no <laughs> consent agenda uh, 4C. Consider a resolution authorizing the annual procurement of senior meal program services with the Visiting Nurse Association of Texas in the union amount here through the City of Grand Prairie Cooperative Purchasing Agreement, number 22140, with an annual estimated expenditure amount of $75,000. And Mr. Stevenson is here to answer any questions that you may have, but this item is for feeding our seniors at our senior center. Mr. Stevenson, you got any? 
Anything you'd like to add? No, I just think uh, this program is 100% supported by a federal grant through the DAAA, so you know, city of Mount Hope is certainly supported. And we're feeding about approximately how many through that, do you know? For me? Approximately how many seniors we feed through the DNA? Uh, approximately 50 to 60 a day. 50 a day. Yeah. And, that, and that's just here. That's just here. And I do know that on uh, Wednesday, I guess, the service we have, the meals of service that we have here in our city at the rec center, if anybody would like to help serve those meals or come in and help distribute, if you just want to drive, it's still going on. It started with COVID, but they're going on. Drive to the Drop food in. Sorry? Drop food in. It's in person only. Oh, it is? It's in person only. See, I'm glad I said something. So drive to the in. Drop food in. Okay. So to serve, then you've got to be certified all the rest of the stuff. Right. So never mind. <laughs> Unless you get certified as a food handler, I guess. Correct. Yeah, okay. Okay, everything is an update, and that's good. Thank you, Mr. Steen. Yeah. I appreciate that. All right. Okay, the last consent agenda item is item 4D, adoption of an ordinance uh, regarding the request of David Jones, applicant, rep representing Chris Kachesen. 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 Close. Very close. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, owner for a zoning change for ED downtown district to LOR local office retail district on Richard F. Hall AUST 566 PG 080 GR 18, more commonly known as 609 and 611 South Main Street in the city of Duncanville, Dallas County, Texas. And if you recall, Mayor Council, um, a public hearing was held on this item at our last city council meeting. And um, our development services team and Mr. Hager were here to answer any questions that you may have. Well, I had a question. If I remember, did we approve the zoning at our last meeting on this particular item? And I'm just wondering, like, why do we have it again? And the answer was, is last time we approved the zoning of it, now we're approving the ordinances to implement the zoning change that we approved last time. So while it right. appeared you put this to me, then I once understood the, the details of it. That's why we have it again tonight. And, and we've been doing this because there are many times when the council wants to add conditions. That keeps us from having to try to make them during the meeting. So if we want something or add something to the zoning case, then that gives us time to properly prepare so we're not trying to do it on the fly. Right, right. So any other questions, comments, input on the side? <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Uh, interim City Manager Brown. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think that concludes the agenda. Yes, it does. Uh, there's a consent agenda. And then we'll go into item number two for our work session. That's the City Council calendar. Uh, so, City Secretary Jamie Roman, any updates and changes on that? Thank you, Mayor. Just to some brief things from the Mr. Martin, but uh, Mr. Kelly will be appearing for a full town meeting for the afternoon and then we'll go out for lunch. And it's been moved to the city council chambers. Um, Monday, May 15th is well, the earliest day that we can town meet because that's the day anticipated the Dallas County election will have the final uh, results from the election. And then just briefly touching back on the recommended budget date, April 27th, because it's next week, a week from this Thursday is the town hall at the Hopkins Senior Center starting at 6 p.m. and held to be meeting by 8 p.m. And then uh, we sent out a general request to the council uh, to select between June 8th or June 15th for the council's pre-budget workshop. And then the only other thing that we have is that the council would consider at some point, and you don't have to do it now, but going forward that our first city council meeting in July is, is the national holiday of July 4th. So, as I understand it, then, you did send out a, a dual request for calendar preferences for yes. the 8th or the 15th of June, yes. but then still showing as an or, so that means we don't have a decision yet? Not yet. So has everybody voted? No. Without naming names, if you haven't yet voted, please vote your preferences so we can select either the 8th or the 15th uh, for the pre-budget workshop. Very important that we get that nailed down now. Thank you. That's the first thing I looked at when I saw the calendar was looking for that date on in June to see.
see where we had locked it down, so we can just go ahead and not use that one. All right. Okay. Any comments, questions? John was saying this one is for getting this out and getting it to all the people. It is important to keep the register of public requirements. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other things on the calendar? All right. Moving on to brief presentations of land property updates. Uh, Mr. Tennant. Thank you, sir. Mayor Council, tonight I'm here to give you guys an update on the updates of the um, events that have occurred since our last meeting about last month. <coughs> As you all recall, this is our calendar that we continue to show you all. We are basically on track right now. We are at the section right now where we're at the beginning of April. Uh, where we're looking into filing an application for a zoning change for the text amendment, uh, which we are going to basically file with the uh, planning and zoning, so that way it can come through the proper channels, so that way it can be heard by you all for your ultimate recommendation, for your ultimate decision, decision on the property. Uh, and then, of course, um, we've talked about the previous ones, but just to touch base on it, just as a reminder, we have sub five, which of course will prepare the case report and send notifications out within 200 feet, which is a state requirement by law here within the, in the state of Texas to inform those neighbors of the um, changes that will be occurring around them. Next, we will be basically um, taking that to the Planning and Zoning Commission, where we will basically get their recommendation, which was offered this body, as stated earlier, for the ultimate decision. All right, next, um, we're looking at June for Planning and Zoning, for that November 4th Planning and Zoning, June of 2023, uh, where we will, at that time, uh, basically have that text amendment and everything for Planning and Zoning to make that recommendation. And then, of course, July is the timeline that we have currently on on par for that decision as stated earlier. All right. Just a minute. Can you roll back one? Yes, sir. Unless you're going to get to it. Can you give me, do you have any better range on step five for the end of April, beginning of May? Is it, is it looking a little tighter? Or if not, it's okay. You don't need to say anything, but I'm just wondering if there's a little tighter date that you might be looking at. There. Well, we have a meeting for planning and zoning the second Monday of the month. That's okay. what we're looking at having that plan for that particular time. Okay, very good. Thank yes. you. Any other questions in that regard? Okay. All right, just to let you all know for a no basis, as of last the time we spoke, we're trying to basically get in touch with all the uh, boards and commissions to basically make their uh, be a little aware of what was occurring. So we have talked to five, Keep Out the Bill Beautiful, of course, the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, the um, Economic Development Corporation, the Neighborhood Vitality Commission, as well as the Park and Recreation Advisory. We have met with all of them. They are aware, and we're awaiting recommendations from those bodies as well. Do they have deadlines for us to submit anything back? Yes, they have. They, some of them do have deadlines, but we're meeting with those so that way we can confirm that for next week. Yes. We need to keep this rolling. That's what I'm asking. You. Oh, yes. We're headlines on this. We're getting information. Yes, sir. We, we're, we're, we're on par. Yes, sir. Okay. Just to kind of let, let you all know, we had two meetings, successful meetings. We had tried to do three meetings. Unfortunately, due to the weather, we were limited to just two meetings. Uh, so that was on March the 10th for the first meeting and March the 23rd for the next meeting. These are some pictures from those active meetings that we did uh, to take down. All right, just to kind of go a little step on um, what we've done so far, we have completed the we've, um, phone meetings with the boards and municipal commissions. We are getting information back from them uh, as well. Uh, there's also the public input process period. We are um, actually waiting for UTD, which we basically outsource that to our UTD um, stakeholders to process that information to provide to us. Uh, to assist us with this process to help with that tight timeline. So we're waiting on that information to come back. This, of course, was ironically during their spring break. So I, just will, I definitely want to commend those students uh, because they took their time, some of them during spring break, to actually come and help with to conduct these meetings. So I do want to give them a shout out and appreciation for that as well. And again, the community meetings are being uh, completed. The input, as you asked earlier, uh, Mr. Mayor, we are getting that information from the boards and commissioners. And again, I already went through the steps three through seven, but this is just the slide to just kind of take you any closer to it. If there are any specific questions on it, I verbalized it earlier. If you have any specific questions, I'll be happy to entertain those right now. Okay, one quick question or comment. How is the relationship with UTD, the master's program, and production data? In what regard? <laughs> good. I think it's pretty good. I mean, is there, is there open communication between them yes. and y'all in terms of what they're finding, what they're thinking, what they're seeing in terms of staff giving back and forth and conversation? Yes, yes. To answer your question, yes, there definitely is to that. And also to expound on even farther, during our meetings, we actually have breakout sessions after the meeting when everybody left 
to make sure that we were all capturing and actually talking or understanding the old dynamic of the meeting, you know, and also the communication that we received via the print that we received. But yes, we were all able to take that into context and then again we're after the call meeting. Now we're just waiting for them to pull all that data together and then share with us all hopefully in that regard. I know this is part of their capstone for the yes. master master's program. I did I think we all had an opportunity to meet with the chair of the business department that's watching over the Dr. Harrison, yes, this cohort. Is the plan then for once they complete their analysis and assessment that it's going to him before it comes to us, or is there going to be a joint kind of move on it? It's going to go to them because, again, it is a capstone. I had a truly one that I want to say about two decades ago now to tell my age. Yes, it is something that you definitely want to share analysis because this is how they learn to become better professionals. Uh, and that way there's no none of the um, uh, political aspects of it, if you will, because this is what they, how they get their teeth wet in the whole software and the system of things. So that is, there's a divide there on purpose. Thank you. Yes, sir. I kind of alluded to this earlier, but this is, part, this is my official slide. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Yes, sir. So I think what I'm hearing is that everything's on schedule. That is accurate. Yes, sir. We just got the, the deadline and we'll go from there. Yes, sir. And I appreciate y'all being uh, on top of this to keep things moving forward. And we'll thank all the staff for that. Um, <laughs> What's the so the status of the text amendment? Um, so that that will not be drafted until after we really get the data back from the UDC. <coughs> yes, right? that is accurate right, because we want to utilize the meeting, and that's one of the purpose of the meeting is the one that on it was for the land property aspect, so we can get a feel for what exactly they want the community want things to be, and we want to capture that and bring that. And uh, it was alluded to during I think our second meeting. <coughs> we want to bring that data forth. And again, that's what planning and zoning and also you guys, the body, have an opportunity to chew it down and basically give your um, statements on it as well. But we at least need to have that as a foundation to pull from for the conversation to start from. And so we'll, we'll get to see the data before it takes and it's drafted. Yes. Because <coughs> it'll be, a, if it, for you specifically, because of course it'll be available for planning and zoning to answer that question more accurately. That kind of follows into what I was thinking also, Mr. Coons, is that as they prepare their data, reviewed by their department chair. The department chair is looking at it in terms of its applicability and its usability for us as a council. And as the staff looks at it, when it comes to us for the use of that text amendment, which is critical. Now, Mr. Gutierrez. Um, are the, uh, is the UTD team interacting directly with you? No, they're interacting with Nathan Warren, our senior planner. Okay. Yes. Thank you all. All right, thank, thank you. you. That concludes our work session briefing time. So I will turn it over to Mr. Hager. Do we have adequate time, do you believe, to go into executive session and conclude by the time we come back up by 7? Yes. All right, very good. All right, so we will then recess. Time stamp on this. It's going to be 618, Secretary. And citizens, please vacate the room.
good to see you guys. Uh, we just want to thank you for uh, all that you do on behalf of Crossroads of Life and uh, just your service and everything that you do for our community. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that you give us to pray over each uh, person that's here tonight, Lord, and uh, what they're going to be doing. Father, we thank you. We believe that you have just selected them to do uh, business, Father, on, on behalf of this uh, beautiful city, Lord. We just pray that you continue to help them, give them wisdom, give them guidance. Father, and as we continue to grow as a community, uh, that we can be an example, Lord, not just to uh, the surrounding areas, Father, but this region and, and this state, Father, that we can just be a light and show them, Father, how community can be done, Father. And we just continue to pray in uh, the right businesses, the right people, uh, just the right things into this beautiful city. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We are back on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number two on our agenda, proclamations and presentations. Uh, the first item is a proclamation and recognition of Earth Day in Duncanville 2023. Presenting this will be Council Member Karen Cherry, and receiving it will be Mr. Tyler Agee, Assistant Director of Parks and, Rec Par Parks and Recreation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Office of the Mayor, Duncanville, City of Champions, proclamation. Whereas the global community continues to face extraordinary challenges such as environmental degradation, extreme weather, events, resource shortages, and global health issues. And whereas the City of Duncanville recognizes the important role that our nature environment plays in maintaining a healthy so uh, society and strong sorry, and strong economy, and whereas all people, regardless of race, gender, income, or geography, have the right to a healthy, sustainable environment and economic growth and opportunity, and whereas we are all caretakers of our planet and have an obligation to combat climate challenge and environmental degradation to preserve the Earth's beauty and resources, and whereas Earth Day is a time to celebrate the goal of inspiring environmental awareness and encouraging the conservation, protection, and appreciation of our natural resources, and whereas a sustainable environment environment can be achieved on an individual level through education efforts, public policy, and is the responsibility of each of us to safeguard our environments and resources. Now, th now therefore, Barry L. Gordon, Mayor of the City of Duncanville, Texas, does hereby proclaim April the 22nd, 2023 as Earth Day in Duncanville and encourages all business, institutions, and individuals to celebrate the earth through one's own action and in the support of the city's ongoing sustainability initiatives. Thank you, Councilmember Cherry. The next item on our agenda is a proclamation. And this proclamation is in recognition of Jewish American Heritage Month. And receiving this particular proclamation is Dr. Jeffrey Feinberg, Professor of Hebrew Studies at the Dallas International University. Professor Feinberg. And anyone else with you you would like to have come up, they're most more than welcome to come up with you. I know this is your wife, Pat, this gentleman. No, I'm just oh, Rabbi Jaspo. Oh, thank you. Nice to meet you. I see your emails a lot. <laughs> come over here. So, whereas, in 1654, a small ship carrying 23 Jewish refugees sailed into the port of present-day New York City. And whereas, a small band of courageous men and women were fleeing oppression and discrimination, and they faced resistance from colony leaders. 
And whereas they became the first Jewish communal presence on American soil, and whereas they expanded the frontier of religious freedoms that would help define the bedrock of American principles on which this country was founded, and whereas throughout our country's history, Jewish Americans have proudly served our nation in uniform, in elected office, and on our nation's highest courts, and whereas Jewish Americans have made significant contributions to America's cultural, scientific, artistic, and intellectual life, and whereas Jewish Americans have marked marched, petitioned, and boarded buses to demand civil and political rights for all, from women's rights to voting rights to workers' rights. Therefore, I, Barry L. Gordon, Mayor of the City of Duncanville, Texas, do hereby proclaim May 2025 as Jewish American Heritage Month. We are pleased and proud to do this uh, business with you. That's a fine bill. like to say a few words. I'm very grateful to be here uh, as a blessing to uh, Duncanville and to Texas and to the United States. I've brought uh, with me uh, Rabbi Steve Jessel, uh, who has a, a congregation in Duncanville. And of course, Pat and I are Duncanville residents, and we train people to go to the ends of the earth to translate the word of God both the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures to make good on a pledge made long ago by our Lord Jesus Christ to go to the ends of the world to tell every nation that he's risen from the grave. It's my pleasure to be a part of the historic heritage of Jewish people praying for and blessing the American citizenry, and I do that as an American Jew. On that note, I'd like to join the city council and uh, to, the, to all of you sitting out there, uh, say a blessing, the Aaronic benediction. I'll say it in the Hebrew and then in the English. Yiberech Adonai v'yishmerecha Yair Adonai parvelecha v'chuneka Yiso Adonai parvelecha Yasev lecha you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. The peace that passes understanding. Lakeisha and Kevin Berry here. Lakeisha, Kevin didn't make it. He's busy. He's busy. Well, you'll be able to explain where he is when we get done. Well, one of the other things that it's my honor and pleasure to do is to recognize champions of our city. And one of the opportunities I have is to do this tonight and to recognize Lakeisha and Kevin Berry. Come over here. Duncanville residents for 15 years and Grambling State University graduates, Lakeisha and Kevin Berry founded the Duncanville Tigers Youth Organization in 2013, a nonprofit to serve, train, and mentor student athletes in academic pursuits. While the organization was conceived to help their two sons, 
both graduates of Duncanville High School, it now serves 200 plus families and over 600 students in the Duncanville area. Lakeisha and Kevin manage all operations for the organization and fund it primarily themselves. Their mentees have achieved local, state, and national recognition in football, track and field, and cheer, and competing and aiming for the STARS African American Male Academic Bowls. Assisted today by a strong group of volunteers, they both provide free tutoring to students, athletes, three to five times weekly. Their twofold goal is to mentor both student athletes and volunteers to continue their legacy. In their own words, as long as there is a need, we will make available ourselves available to serve. For their investment in and substantive and sustainable impact on our city, Lakeisha and Kevin Berry are hereby recognized as champions of the city. As mayor of the city of Duncanville, I ask our residents to join me in congratulating them on this memorable occasion. Lakeisha, congratulations. <laughs> with that as a medallion for our city and talking with you earlier about coming tonight I know you it's like you had to juggle schedules so take a second or a minute to talk about what you do and where Kevin is right now okay. um, well thank you all thank you mayor Borden um, thank you all for allowing this time in your uh, ceremony tonight to recognize us we appreciate it um, as mayor Borden stated we are um, in the middle of practice tonight where our track and field season is in progress um, we coach about, uh, I think we have about 50 kids right now, and that's where uh, Kevin is. Some of you may know him as Coach Barry. He's the guy that you typically walk up to any park, whether it's Reed or over at Lakeside. He's the ball guy that's typically yelling at the kids. <laughs> uh, but he's over uh, holding practice down, and as soon as I'm done, I'll head back over to him. Uh, but again, thank you for recognizing us. We, we certainly appreciate this opportunity to be recognized. Yes. All right, it is an honor and a pleasure for us to do that for our folks in our city. Item number three is citizens input. Pursuant to section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code, any member of the public has the opportunity to address the City Council concerning any matter of public business or on any posted agenda item. However, the act prohibits the City Council from delivering any, any issues not on the public agenda and such non-agenda issues may be referred to city staff for research and any future action. All persons addressing are subject to council rules and limitations permitted by law. <coughs> Our current limitations and rules that we have, number one, <coughs> excuse me, um, we no longer read out loud any citizen inputs that are emailed to us. However, each of us here on the council that goes into the record uh, we receive those, and each of us has one of those. We've received one this particular week, and each of us on the member of Civic Council has that input, and we have, will have read it and be made part of the record. The other limitation is individuals who are here and present and wish to speak to us during this and comment period are limited to a two-minute time frame. And when I call you forward, please state your name and your address for the record. So I have one and only card here with me tonight. And that is Homer Fincana. Mayor. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Yeah, we're supposed to be turning off the citizen, the, the audio for this as well.
we are back on. Thank you very much. Okay, just as one note of housekeeping on the agenda, you will note that we had an executive session that has been completed. Uh, we're going to take the, uh, where it says take action necessary as a result of executive session. That is going to become item number seven on the agenda. We're adding that at the very end of our agenda tonight. Moving on to item number four, the consent agenda. The following may be acted upon in one motion. The city council member may request items be removed from the consent agenda for individual consideration. None of that has been done. So city secretary, please read the consent agenda item. Thank you, Mayor. Our consent agenda item 4A, consider approval of draft city council meeting minutes for the special called city council meeting of March 14, 2023. 4B, consider an ordinance amending chapter 19 traffic article one in general, section 19-1. Definitions by adding a definition for oversized vehicles by amending Chapter 19, Traffic, Article 6, Stopping, Standing, and Parking, by amending Section 19-115, Standing or Parking of Trucks, Tractors, and Trailers in Commercial Vehicles, by amending Section 19-116, No Parking and or Placement of Oversized Vehicles, Storage Unit, Cargo Container, or Recreational Vehicle on City Streets, by adding subsections B and C and renumber current subsection B to subsection D. C, consider a resolution authorizing the annual procurement of senior meal program services with Visiting Nurse Association of Texas in the unit amount bid through the City of, of Grand Prairie Cooperative Purchasing Agreement number 22140 with an annual estimated expenditure amount of $75,000. D, adoption of an ordinance regarding the request of David Jones, applicant representing Chris Kajajian, am I saying that right? Okay. Owner for a zoning change from DD, downtown district to LOR, local office retail district on Richard F. Hale Abstract, 566, page 080, tract 18, more commonly known as 609 and 611 South Main Street in the city of Duncanville, Dallas County, Texas. Thank you, the chair will entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Councilmember Mac Burnett. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Contreras. Council, please vote. Thank you, unanimously approved. Moving on to items for individual consideration, item number uh, 5A. Consider resolution approving an incentive grant by the Duncanville Community and Economic Development Corporation, DCEDC, to D Squared Catering, LLC, in the amount of $6,946.62 for qualified expenditures for a building located at 519 East Highway 67, Duncanville 75116. Mr. Mansell, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, tonight we have a signage grant request from D Squared Catering, LLC in the amount of $6,946.62 uh, per year agenda packet tonight. You'll notice that uh, also in the presentation that this is the highest bid amount that they got from their three bids per our policy, and the DCEDC approved this unanimously. I would like to also point out that this uh, property is within opportunity area number one, which one of the things that we seek to do in this area per the comp plan is to identify non-conforming properties and work with property owners to relocate and bring the property into compliance. As you may remember, they have uh, been here before for some other incentives related to the relocation. It was a business retention grant to keep them here related to some infrastructure improvements to bring the facility into compliance. They successfully got their CO, um, and now the, the kind of cherry on top is the signage to help illustrate their catering business at this location. Um, also in your packet, you should have the three bids which outline um, the different uh, signs that they are proposing and you can see it here as well all of the signs being proposed are um, are lit signs they're the back lit LED and so they'll they'll really pop there on uh, highway 67 um, per their taxable revenue from their property tax at the location in addition to their sales tax revenue to the city they generate about ten thousand dollars a year to the city in, uh, in tax and so to recoup this grant would uh, take us about 0.67 years to recuperate, and we look at a, uh, a rule of thumb of within 10 years, and so that definitely meets that guideline as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Just one quick question, roll back one slide if you would. I know that the, um, 
okay, the business generated it was in their prior location. This is a new location for D squared. Correct, and the so property those, tax. Those business dollars revenues were in the lo old location. Correct. Correct. Uh, these property, uh, the property tax here is their new location. Is their new location in yes, addition sir. to the new? But but we don't know new revenues. I'm not asking that question. I'm just saying that the sales tax for that particular next to last bullet, the seventy nine sixty four, was in their old location. That is correct. There's no estimation on on future. Correct, since they just okay. opened at their new location. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comment? Thank you, Chair. Entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Mount Mr. Mac Burnett. Second by Mr. Kuntz. Council, please vote. Thank you. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Item 5B, consider approving a grant of hotel occupancy and tax funds from the 2022-23 budget and authorizing the execution of a grant funding agreement in an amount not to exceed $36,000 to Exposure Incorporated. Mr. Gus Garcia, Director of our Economic Development Services, presenting. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Augustin Garcia, Managing Director of Development Services. Thank you for having us here tonight. Before you is an application grant for uh, hot tax funds for an event that's going to be taking place in the city of Duncanville next month. I'm um, happy to say that eSports, uh, somewhat of a misnomer, it's eSports is bridging the gap between art, education, and sports. Video games are packages of many forms of art in the form of design, writing, music, as well as many other fields, campuses across America are incorporating esports into their educational curriculum, graphic design, artistic expression, coding, et cetera. The number of high schools, universities adding esports to their extracurricular offerings has increased exponentially over the past several years. There are over 1,200 high school esports teams and over 170 collegiate esports teams, many of which offer scholarships to qualified students. A little bit of background regarding this grant. In, 2020, in 2022, Exposure hosted the first Texas high school and middle school esports championships. In January 2023, Exposure hosted the Unified Pro Amateur Association Regionals in partnership with the NBA. UPA uh, is the acronym you'll see in a few minutes. Uh, May 5th through 7th, 2023, will be the second Texas high school and middle school esports championships hosted by Exposure. I have a representative from Exposure, the actual owner, next to me, standing next to me. Uh, Mr. Danny Martin. The attendance has doubled with 400 registrants. Bringing esports competitions to Dunkerville has been a mission of Exposure, and the nation is taking notice. Uh, Exposure is developing the next generations of professionals, and by professionals we mean the next generations of graphic designers, game developers, and producers. It's no longer just gaming, it's actual productions. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about that in a few minutes. The benefits to Dunkerville, in 2022, 40 hotel rooms were reserved and used. In January 2023, 160 hotel rooms were reserved and used. 60 rooms were reserved, 150 people for the UPA regionals. 250 people attended the event. 90% of the attendees did not reside in Texas. 100 rooms have been reserved, 350 people for the Texas eSport Championships. 400 people attended the event, are expected to attend the event. 90% of participants are expected from outside of Dunkerville. Traveling teams are asked to purchase hotels in Dunkerville for a discounted rate, a term we call stay to play. So the grant explanation, uh, April 18, 2023, council meeting of the Texas Esports Championships, a $36,000 grant is being requested. 18,000 will be spent in the Austin, San Antonio, and Houston market. These are gonna be for promotional expenses, which qualifies under the hot fund expenditure program. 18,000 will be spent on promotional materials to be advertised and global online broadcast. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, these are productions. Mr. Martin can probably talk a little bit more about that, so do you wish. Uh, these are some of the events he's held at the center there off of the expressway. Um, and that's all I have, so if you have any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, might wanna ask uh, Mr. Martin, I'm familiar with Danny and what he does over at Exposure. Uh, if any council has not been able to come over there to see that operation and understand what it's about, I really invite you to go on over there. Uh, Ms. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I agree. I, I had the opportunity to visit your place, and it is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, same thing. I've 
very familiar with Mr. Martin and his operations. Been on the place there. I'd encourage citizens to go there as well to see what his operation is, ab is about. And, and, and Mayor, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion to approve. Uh, thank you, Mr. McBurnett. We do have a motion to approve. Uh, is there a second? A second. Second by Council Member Cherry. Uh, before taking the vote, I just want to say thank you to Danny Martin for bringing exposure to our city. Uh, it's a fantastic, it's a superb operation in terms of what you've done to the physical aspects of it and making it a, what should we say, putting Duncanville on the map for eSports e throughout the entire globe for what's happening. So we do thank you for that. Uh, so council members, please vote. We have a motion to approve. Unanimously approved. Thank you for your, for all that you do for our city. Thank you, thank you. Item 5C, consider an ordinance of the City of Duncanville, Texas, approving and adopting an increase in the exemption of appraised value of residents' homesteads in the city from $30,000 to $35,000 of appraised value for an adult who is 65 years of age or older, an increase to the exemption of appraised value of residents' homesteads in the city from $30,000 to $35,000 of appraised value for an adult who receives disability insurance benefits under federal old age, survivors, and disability insurance, amending the code of ordinances by amending chapter 18, taxation, article one, in general, by amending subsection 18.4 title from reserve to levy of property tax, and adding language by amending subsection 18.5 title from reserve to residence homestead exemption for senior citizen, and adding language, and by amending subsection 18.6 from reserve to residence homestead exemption for disabled, and adding language. Turning this over to Jennifer Odeby, our Chief Innovation Officer. The Thank you, good yours. evening, Mayor and Council. So yes, kicking off the 23-24 uh, budget year, um, and when we were preparing the 22-23 budget, um, we had uh, um, committed to bringing this back to you um, in this tax year for 23, uh, to consider increasing the senior experience and, and disabled homestead exemption by 5,000. So as you've read, the 30,000 to 35,000 of appraised value. Um, that estimated impact, I calculated based on the 22 uh, certified tax values, I calculated that to be um, about 109,000. But again, that's on the 22 values. Um, the last year that we did a revision was in 2018 when we brought it from 26,400 up to 30,000. So that is purpose number one of this ordinance, and then uh, number two, of course, is adding the language into the code of ordinances as it is not referenced um, about exemptions um, in our code of ordinance language currently. Just to give you an idea of dates, the reason why this is being brought forth to you at this time, um, this Dallas Central Appraisal District has a deadline of April 25th if we want to have this um, in their hands so they can have it for the preliminary EVR, which is the estimate of value report that they release on May 8th. Um, additionally, they have a, a deadline of July 3rd if it's not um, by April 25th for the certified roles to have this ordinance for them to make the changes. Um, just to give you an idea of what, um, on April 13th, we had a virtual uh, meeting with Dallas Central Appraisal District to give us their um, calendar as well as what they are planning and their trends, um, so we know what to expect when it comes to property uh, values. So um, they, per Dallas Central Appraisal District entities, will see an increase in market value as the market remains positive, so meaning the supply of homes um, are low, but um, the supply is still up from 2022. Um, entities, market and taxable values will increase due to 23 reappraisal efforts and capped homestead cal recalculations. So um, for the city of Duncanville, their reappraisal plan is 71% of residential um, homes will be reappraised this year, and commercial reappraisal plans will be 55%. Just to kind of give you a context of, of um, what we can expect with values for this um, 2023 tax year. Um, I know if you've been keeping up following with the um, legislation, there's sort certainly a lot of property tax um, conversations happening at the state. Um, mainly, um, the city is mainly t targeting school districts, from what I've read, in terms of the property tax exemptions, trying to uh, relieve the burden on um, uh, residential homeowners. 
Um, but something just to keep in mind that is on the move currently, it passed the House and it's in the State Senate. Um, and don't have any necessarily bearing, I think, on the city, but um, that they are imposing a 5% appraisal cap. Right now it's at 10%. So um, if that is passed by the Senate, that'll go to the voters in November of 23. But just in all context, when it comes to property tax, wanted to share that information with you as well. So, any questions? Yes, Mr. Harvey. Thank you. So, if this particular initiative passes, then the next step would be that the city would contact the appraisal district and let them know, hey, by the way, this ordinance is passed, and uh, they will reflect it in their property tax calculations that they will be doing uh, over the next few weeks, and it would be reflected in the bills that will come out in October. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Mayor and Council, just for the record, I know some of us are older than the rest of us and may be qualified, but it's an ordinance of general application, not specific application. So all the members that may otherwise qualify for this exemption can vote. Say that again, please. You, you trailed off right if, here at the end. If, we're, if any of you are over 65, you can still vote. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, one last question. This applies to the appraisals that are going to, that we will receive residents are for property taxes in 2023 or not reflected until 2024. It'll be for this tax year, 2023, tax that they'll year. get at the end of this year that they'll pay January 1st. Which will affect our budget process that we're yes, entering sir. into as well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Mr. McBurnett, second by Mr. Harvey. Please vote. Unanimously approved, thank you. Moving on to item number six, staff and board reports. Receive the police department's quarterly report. Chief Levigny, floor is yours, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to, to report. Uh, on the police department's uh, uh, first quarter report from this year. Um, first, I'd like to point out, uh, as I uh, try to do as, as much as possible, that we are an accredited uh, department by the Texas Police Chief Association. And uh, that's important for our citizens to know because uh, we have to go through a stringent, stringent um, number of uh, over 168 items that we have to show that we're compliant with both through our policy and our practice. So that just shows that our, uh, our folks, they work very hard to attain that and, and keep that level where it is. Uh, staffing and personnel, uh, we've got uh, several officers that are uh, in different types of training. Uh, we've got an officer that's uh, currently in field training and uh, she seems to be progressing very well and uh, Jessica Detterman, uh, recruit Paul Becerra, as you might see, just graduated the Basic Police Academy last Friday, and um, he's doing well. He's a grandson of a 42-year uh, retiree of the Dallas Police Department. Um, so we're happy to have him. We've got two recruits, Ashley Garcia and Rocio Vasquez in the Dallas County Sheriff's uh, Department Academy and we are planning a civil service entry exam uh, test for May 20th. Uh, some more staff development, in-service training for several of our supervisors there is listed. Uh, the FBI LEADA program is a law enforcement executive development association program that the FBI, FBI puts together, and it's uh, very good training and it, it keeps our supervisory staff on the cutting edge of, of what um, uh, leadership training and, and so forth. <clears throat> our regional care team 
Uh, as you know, Ambrosio Hernandez uh, is part of that regional care team and does an excellent job for us. Um, in this quarter, those are the numbers. Um, and, and again, numbers can't explain uh, the connections he makes and, um, and, and those, the ways that we minimize our, our um, staff that have to go out and repeat calls um, and, and we keep that in check by uh, this team and um, allowing us to maybe reduce the, the, the emergency apprehensions that our patrol function has to follow up on. So he does a good job there. Um, patrol activity in comparison at a glance. As you can see there, the same quarter for 23 and 22, our calls for service have increased dramatically. Um, and the um, citations there has, has been requested, or the, I'm sorry, the traffic stops uh, have also increased. And then the top five cited violations are at the bottom uh, as requested. Uh, FMR, FR is uh, basically an insurance citation. I know that was asked last time. Uh, then speeding, no driver's license, exper expired registration, and driving while license invalid. Uh, Citizen Patrol, our BMV report cards and, and what they've done over the quarter, uh, the different locations that are listed there, January, February, March, and uh, the pass rate's going up, uh, at least when we're going out. Uh, we, we can't uh, tell our citizens enough or ask for their help to you know, lock, hide, or take their, their belongings uh, when they're leaving their vehicles unattended. So um, apparently we're getting the message out at least when we're going out and monitoring that. Department activity, number of use force incidents uh, over the period. We had six and all of, all of them were within policy uh, and lawful. Uh, number of vehicle pursuits, we had two, they were within our policy and guidelines. Number of complaints, we had one policy violation which was sustained. Community engagement, uh, Officer Michelle Arias uh, is, is very heavily involved in this area of our department, but she needs help. And all of our people should be ambassadors for community engagement. Uh, we've got one in the back, uh, does a good job in helping with that where he can. Where he can and uh, several other folks that are pictured here and that just get out in the community in general. There's our NIVERS group A offenses for the quarter. Uh, st stay pretty steady, we're down slightly. If you kind of look through that, I'll give you just a couple of seconds. If you would take a moment to explain what the cleared column actually indicates for us. So cleared can be done in, in several different ways. We have uh, cleared means if uh, we've uh, investigated an offense and we've been able to either make an arrest or in some other way we know the suspect, but because of some extenuating circumstances, we either um, maybe they uh, are no longer um, with us, uh, maybe there's prosecutorial um, a discretion that they don't want to prosecute a, a case or uh, there's several other different ways in which an exceptional clearance may take place. Clearance is a good thing through which uh, we can affirmatively say we know who did this, we either put them in jail or for whatever other reason we're not going to be able to follow through. Maybe a, maybe a victim who thought um, maybe I don't want to prosecute after I reported something. So those are some examples there. Okay. Oh, Mr. Harvey, please. Thank you. Uh, Chief, uh, piggybacking on a question about uh, the clearance rates, uh, that's usually a function that's handled by the Criminal Investigation Division, right? In many cases, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are some times when our patrol officers go out and they answer a call, they investigate preliminarily, and they can make an arrest there on the scene, and that is a clearance. But in many ways, people think of Criminal Investigation Division of clearing cases, yes, sir. Right, and uh, going back to one of your first slides, um, I noticed that Officer Luna, notwithstanding, your force appears to be getting younger. 
Uh, We're always getting younger, I think. Yeah. Okay, that, that wasn't anything that needed a response. But uh, on a serious note, um, you mentioned the accreditation process. And so uh, when is the next uh, round of accreditation scheduled? And um, how do you all go about ramping up for it? So first of all, it's an ongoing process. Uh, every year we have to submit um, a proofs that we're still in compliance. Uh, every four years, uh, we will actually get an assessor to come to our location, to, to our department, and we'll evaluate everything that we say we're doing by policy and evaluate if that's being carried out to the extent they can. For They're typically here for two to three days, and they'll evaluate uh, through conversations with individuals through watching how we take calls, and um, again, just checking to make sure we're in compliance with what we say we are. Um, we had one, I believe it was two years ago, so I think we're still two years out for the four-year recertification, re-recognition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So here's a, a slide. Now you'll notice uh, that uh, we've got positive feedback on in the past, you notice DeSoto, uh, when we checked on this in preparation for this report, um, and, and there could be a number of reasons. Um, you know, maybe they saw something they needed to take a look at before it came out and got approved through, through, through the NIVR site, but DeSoto had not reported uh, their March numbers, and that's, that's why it's not showing up there. Um, pretty well in line um, with kind of what We've seen normally we, we dropped off quite a bit, as you can see there in February. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a good reason for that. Sometimes crime goes up, goes down, and you just don't have. I will tell you that there was a lot of a lot of talk um, over the last during this period, and um, a D Dallas uh, Police Department they they mentioned uh, their violent crime had gone down. Um, and they were measuring that. And uh, they can, their violent crime consisted of uh, homicides, uh, aggravated assaults, and I believe it was robberies. And I went back and looked at, at ours as well. That's not something, uh, you know, you can put a group of offenses together and call it what you want, but that's what they were measuring on. There was a lot of media attention on that. Ours, over the last three years, have by and large gone down um, steadily. And over the last three years, we were down uh, over 13% in those areas uh, when you take them cumulatively. Uh, one moment, Mr. Harvey, please. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, Chief, I want to tell you that I personally really appreciate this schedule because it provides a set of context, I think, in terms of uh, how we compare uh, to the cities around us. So. Um, I just think this is a really great uh, illustration and, and it really uh, communicates a sense of where we are. Thanks, sir. So we were trying to get back. I know a couple of y'all had a uh, desire to change up who we were comparing to with the motor vehicle thefts. And once we kind of got back on and was trying to get ready for this report tonight, the site was down. And then we were up against the deadline to get this to you guys. Um, it may very well be up. You know, tomorrow, uh, sometimes it goes down for maintenance just like everything does with a computer. And just trying to be transparent and, and give that to y'all. We'll, we'll work out and get that uh, as best we can for every quarterly report as we have done. So, Mr. Brown, we'd expect when that comes through to give it to us. Thank you. Okay. So uh, here's a breakdown, and um, I was told, and I believe we have, it, even though it was only a couple of streets, we've aligned this map uh, and the subsequent maps that you'll see in the slides to uh, what the city most recently changed their uh, council districts to. So there are uh, the major crimes that we report on, and to give you a couple of seconds to look at that. This is for January. Uh, Chief, I'm going to roll back to the, the NIBRS listing. Um, 
I received a phone call from a citizen alleging some individuals were having intercourse in front of their house. Where does that fall? Um, so these are he, he part said he, did call, he, he said he did call law enforcement. They didn't witness it, but uh, I'm just wondering, looking at that list, I was trying to figure out where would that fall? So guess. I'd have to know more circumstances, but it, it could very well fall under 11 or 36. Um, it potentially could fall under 40. Uh, just would have to have more circumstances for a specific incident. Um, and, th and then we're assuming um, if somebody called that there was something to, they wanted to report something or they were still there when we got there. Um, so potentially one of those three is the best answer I can give you. Yeah, they did say that the, it was not occurring when law enforcement showed up. So it's, it's, they can still it's make really a hard for, our law, if for if a police a officer report. to determine where that falls. I was just curious about it. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's February for the same offenses. And March. And that concludes our report. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Thank you, Chief. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Oh, Appreciate it. Sorry. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Contreras. After or before? Well, um, I, I think that's attributed mostly to our officer self-initiated activity um, and mainly uh, most attributable to extra patrols. Uh, we get a lot, I mean, we look at this map and we, we alert our officers, hey, listen, we're having issues up in this area. We're having issues up in this area. And officers understand that through their training and experience, of being on the streets, uh, they know typical problem locations uh, for different things. So uh, I think a lot of that can be attributable to just our officer, you know, making those extra patrols and documenting that because that's important because we could get a report later. It may help us on, uh, I mean, obviously it may catch somebody uh, in the act of something, but it may help us in investigating something if we can kind of tighten that window of when something may have occurred. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts? Thank you, Chief. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. And always, I'm sure I speak for the entire council, we so much appreciate our law enforcement from very, very top all the way down to those officers on the beat. And we see our patrol cars in neighborhoods, we see our patrol cars around our shopping areas, and we thank all of our officers uh, for all that they do and putting themselves in harm's way every day. They do a great job, don't they? We appreciate the Yes, count. they do. Moving on to item number 6B, Fire Department Quarterly Report Update for the second quarter of the fiscal year. Chief Rohde. Chief, the floor is yours, sir. Good evening, Council, Mayor, City Manager. Uh, we want to thank you all for having the Fire Department come down and do our quarterly report. I want to start off with our staffing. Uh, we have a new hire. His name is Mason Quinn. He started on February the 26th of this year and is in the process of going through orientation and training with our people. He's already a basic certified EMT and uh, firefighter, so we just got to get him uh, where he's up to snuff on the way we do things here in Duncanville. So uh, hopefully that'll be another couple of weeks and then we can count him in staffing. So a quick question, since he's already certified, where did he get that? He went to an academy on his own. Really? Yeah, he uh, went through the whole academy, went through the EMT and everything, and paid his own money, and that's the only way we hire, is wow. you either have to be a certified uh, firefighter or a certified paramedic or both. And he just happened to be the uh, certified uh, firefighter. And we'll okay. later, when we get him all oriented, then we'll send him to paramedic school. There you go, okay, thank you. Uh, currently, we have three vacancies that uh, we're fixing to try to get those filled. 
Uh, before we can do that, we have to give a civil service entrance exam and we're uh, currently working with HR to get that scheduled so we can uh, start the process to try to get those three positions filled. Uh, on April the 28th, we intend to give a engineer promotional exam uh, to fill one of our uh, driver's position who has vacated that position. And there's the reasons why we do. We have uh, engineer Steve Blanchard who was promoted to uh, fire marshal on Friday, March the 31st of 2023. And then uh, we have firefighter David Carpenter, who will be promoted to deputy fire marshal on Monday, uh, April the 24th, 2023. The good news about that is uh, initially we had our fire prevention uh, division. It was just down to an interim fire marshal. So uh, we were getting a lot of inspections done. So now we'll have two people in that uh, division. Uh, of course, Mr. Carpenter will have to go to inspector school and then we can go in there, we can start uh, emphasizing inspections throughout the city of Duncanville. Want to talk about professional development. That's a big deal on my books in the fire department is developing my people. Make sure they are aware of standards, policies that need to be uh, uh, enforced. So we do a lot of uh, professional development in, in the department. Uh, I attended a TEKS leadership conference uh, back uh, January 9th to January the 11th. Uh, we also had our executive assistant, Lacey Freeman, who attended a, um, the Texas Fire Chiefs Association's Fire Administration Conference at College Station on the 23rd through the 25th of January. And my assistant chief, uh, Greg Chase, he attended the uh, Texas Fire Chiefs Association's second in command conference at College Station on January 23rd through the 25th. Moving along more professional development, uh, LexiPol, which is a uh, program that helps us with our uh, policies to make sure that they are uh, following best practice standards and making sure that they meet federal and state and local guidelines, make sure they uh, follow the law according to what those uh, are stated for our policies. We also, uh, I attended a, uh, the Texas Fire Chiefs Association uh, annual executive conference uh, that was in Waco. Uh, that was March the 20th through uh, the 23rd. And then our new fire marshal, he attended the International uh, Association of Arson Investigators seminar uh, down in San Marcos, March 17th, or March 27th through the 31st. I'd like to talk about emergency management accomplishments. Uh, if everyone's aware, Lauren uh, Sanchez, she's our emergency management operations coordinator, top of the game. She, uh, we want to make sure that she is very well trained and very well oriented to uh, emergency management. So we had a training session with the uh, city directors and we brought them into the EOC and they brought in their um, desk phones and they also brought in their computers and we made sure that they could all uh, make a phone call out of our EOC or receive a phone call in our EOC and make sure that their computers could connect to the uh, to whatever connectivity we need whether it be the city network or um, the websites that they could help you know with our uh, taking care of any kind of EOC emergency that we have. Lauren also has been taking uh, doing child safety and emergency preparedness on uh, February the 9th she held a joint safety and emergency preparedness training with our PD uh, and all of our Duncanville churches, which was very, very productive. She also went to uh, Village Tech, uh, uh, taught their staff uh, CPR. Uh, just a moment on that, Mr. Yes. Harvey had a comment, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, excuse me, Chief. Um, how often do you, do you all do those I may be using the wrong terminology, tabletop exercises where you uh, actually simulate an emergency and open up the EOC and go through the process of what to do and when. How, how often do you all do that? Uh, Councilman Harvey, we used to do that every month. And then a little old problem came up called COVID-19 and we had to separate our people. We didn't want them all in the, in the same room. 
So uh, we kind of slow down a lot of our, uh, our exercises and tabletops. So we're starting to build that back up uh, and start doing them uh, monthly. It's just a matter of finding time in between all the other little uh, programs that we have going and we need to get it in instituted with all of our city staff again. But we try to do it on a monthly basis down at the EOC. You're welcome. Um, Duncanville uh, also had a uh, championship parade, as everybody's aware of, and uh, our emergency management coordinator, she went in there and she did the event action plan for that event, and she also helped staff at the, at the event. And as y'all are all, all familiar with, she uh, has uh, big time on uh, the grant application for our Summit pump station uh, generator, and uh, that's definitely something that we need uh, that's that's a big deal when it comes to, to our water supply here in, in Duncanville. Uh, she also, uh, when she was uh, present at the uh, field house shooting that we had, she was instrumental in our child reunification and family assistance center, and she taught that class at uh, the Emergency Management Association of Texas, and it was very, very well received. She also did some reunification center setup training uh, with our uh, PD supervisors and recreation staff on February 23rd. And she also was uh, instrumental in, in creating the second reunification center kit for storage at the uh, recreation center. So she had it with her. We also have the recreation center so somebody can go in there. They've had the training. They can take that kit and go in there and, and start setting everything up to, for reu reunification. She also went and took a class I'd never heard of before, and uh, she, uh, it was called the Complex Coordinated Attack Course, and it has to do with multiple events occurring at one time, such as like a 9-1-1, where they were all uh, the different buildings, the, uh, the, the Pentagon, and then the attack that happened in uh, Pennsylvania where the plane dropped. Uh, that's what that had to do with. I never knew that they had one, so I was, I was happy that she went to that, and and uh, has an idea how that how that's worked. She also is our plan administrator. She goes in there and she makes sure that all of our emergency management plans are all up to date. And she went in there and she wrote a plan for a regional, uh, which is our Lancaster, uh, DeSoto, Cedar Hill, and Duncanville uh, Family Assistance Center, which I think will be a valuable plan in the future in case we have some type of event that uh, would call for that type of a plan to be instituted. We also did a regional medically fragile population wellness check plan, which is, uh, we know it as, as STEER. And we uh, discovered uh, yesterday that they have uh, 30 people who were enrolled in the city of Duncanville, and 18 of those did not respond. So we did get some response from that STEER, but that's where we go and assist these uh, individuals if we have a power outage and they need electricity for certain uh, medically de uh, devices or so they need evacuation out of the house or something. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, yes sir. Let me just interject something Chief, um, and I can't speak for the entire council, this is my own personal observations, but when we, uh, our, our former emergency management coordinator, I can't recall her name at the moment. Tanya Hunter. Tanya, she was basically ranked by the Department of Public Safety from what I heard in heard personally like in the top five of the entire state and I know we were looking at how do we replace somebody of that caliber with my personal observations and interactions with Ms. Sanchez during public events and also during actual emergencies when I've been on site with her I wanted to say that I feel she has most ably filled those very vacant shoes and if you would pass it on for me personally as I said I can't speak for the entire council, but from my observations, interaction with her, we have got the best again. Mayor, I have to agree with you. Uh, I know the people are my counterparts over in Cedar Hill and DeSoto and Lancaster fully agree with you. We, we got a, another winner when it comes to emergency management. So we're really proud to have her and hope we can keep her because she's doing an outstanding job yes, uh, with all our emergency management uh, side of everything. And, Especially on her training, she goes out and makes sure, you know, the different organizations, churches, uh, rec center, all that, um, have uh, training 
of what the type of training they need or she winds up getting the training for them or organizing it and she's been writing a lot of grants so she, she, she's on top of it and so uh, we really appreciate her thank you for the comment I'll pass that on yeah thank you uh, we'll talk a little bit about emergency warning sirens uh, we haven't talked about it in a while yeah uh, here lately we've had some pretty good storms come through and uh, been getting a lot of calls and inquiring about uh, the emergency sirens uh, that a lot of our uh, community don't understand this these sirens one thing we need to understand is that this is an outdoor warning siren system uh, and it's manually operated uh, we have uh, apps on our phone that will go in there I can set that off with my app my assistant chief and of course Lauren can set the sirens off with an app on our phone uh, we also have a secondary uh, set-off point over there at uh, SWRCC, which is our dispatch center. And then we also have the primary, which is down in um, Station 271, uh, or Station 272 in our EOC, where we can set off those sirens. Those sirens are set off with criteria. We don't want to cry wolf with those sirens. Uh, their intention is, is to get people out of the parks get people you know, out of schoolyards and have them seek shelter and then um, turn to TV, radio, whatever, to try to find out what, what's going on. Uh, some of the criteria for that is uh, a tornado warning issued by the National Weather Service uh, to affect the city of Duncanville. Uh, several weeks ago, we, I set the sirens off myself twice. The first time was because I was getting confirmed um, messages that there were 80 mile an hour winds uh, associated with this front that was coming in. So if you'll read down, it says destructive winds in excess of 70 miles per hour. We had them at 80 and then they were confirmed uh, along that front. So uh, the initially we set the, um, the sirens off to uh, indicate they need to take cover because of the 80 mile an hour winds. And then we also got a polygon from the National Weather Service that included uh, Duncanville in that polygon for a tornado uh, warning. Uh, just so everybody knows, you know, there's differences in the storms that you have to look at. Uh, tornado is usually a funnel that has touched the ground. It's, it's doing damage. Uh, a funnel is uh, circulation that's coming down out of the cloud but has not quite reached the ground yet and then uh, circulation up there in the cloud so you'll see the radars they'll say hey we have circulation in the cloud but we don't have any confirmed touchdown of a tornado so we have to monitor all that we listen to the national weather chat so that we can try to get as important a data as we can to make a decision about firing off those sirens uh, it also is usually it's a, a severe thunderstorm morning and it's associated with winds over 70 miles an hour and as y'all are familiar uh, hurricane uh, category one winds are 74 miles an hour so that's getting pretty close to a hurricane strength um, storm uh, also uh, inch and a quarter uh, diameter hail well that's usually associated with a severe thunderstorm warning and also uh, other emergencies that are directed by the appropriate officials. What that would be would be like if you have a major uh, hazardous material spill, like say out on the highways, or you may have a, a vapor, a toxic vapor cloud that's coming across, guided by the winds in Duncanville. So we'd want to set the sirens off to get people to to uh, take shelter. Uh, these sirens usually are heard throughout the whole city. Uh, the only thing I notice is when the wind's blowing. 80 miles an hour, they have a tendency that uh, sound has a tendency to follow with the wind. So um, it's an indication to get out and, get and, and seek uh, cover. Um, we really encourage everyone, uh, usually everybody has a cell phone nowadays, to have some type of weather app that you can uh, monitor the weather and usually it'll send you notifications um, with a caveat that uh, you got to understand that sometimes they'll do a uh, thunderstorm warning for Dallas County. The only problem is Dallas County goes way to the north and that storm may be going across the north side of, uh, of Dallas County 
And a lot of people wonder, well, why are our sirens not going off? Because there's a thunderstorm warning. Well, we may have blue skies uh, above, so why would I want to set off a siren, you know, with, with blue skies uh, above me? So uh, it's important that everybody uh, knows what to do in case of uh, a storm coming through, uh, especially if you have an app with notifications that will let you know. Now, they'll irritate you. I'll tell you, they will irritate you in the middle of the night because uh, if you're trying to get some sleep, you better turn your ringer down because you'll hear a notification every five minutes. It's, it's, it's irritating, but uh, some in my position, I, I've got a monitor, so I'll <laughs> let's do it all night long just to make sure we uh, make the decisions whether to send them, set them sirens off. Um, also, uh, there's a procedure we go through. Uh, when I get ready to set those sirens off, I'll notify the city manager that I'm, uh, that I'm going to do it. Generally, I'll uh, watch and I'll try to catch it 10 minutes before it gets to the western uh, border of the town so that gives people an opportunity to get cover and get out of the, the approaching storm. Once I contact the city manager, that city manager usually contacts uh, the council. Let them know that uh, we're gonna set the sirens off and this is the reason why we're gonna set the sirens off. Then we'll go in there and we'll uh, do a Everbridge message out to everyone who has signed up for Everbridge so they can get a notification that um, you know there's there's some type of storm coming and, and what it is. We try to make it as brief as we can uh, so people can turn into their favorite TV channel and uh, see what the what the de what the details are. So there is a process, and I know y'all have been a part of that process. So uh, it works well. Everybody gets informed, and uh, you know. It's good notification for the community. Uh, Mr. Contreras, just a moment, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, on this screen, um, so the uh, different colored lines that radiate out from the cell tower, or from the sirens, um, does that just kind of represent how far out they reach beyond, because uh, some of them obviously are beyond our city limits. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, what it is is those inside those purple lines is you get a certain amount of dB from them sirens. As you go out, the yellow has, you know, it has a reduced dB, and then as you go out, a little bit more or less dB, and then you get out there into the red, of course, it's out into the city limits uh, at that point, but it's a reduced dB as it travels out away from those so sirens. The people that live out in that area, they can kind of tell when it's coming out of Duncanville versus something that might be in their neck of the woods? And Cedar Hill, say, for instance, because it looks like we reach pretty far out. Um, I, I really ask that because the, n the question really is, how much do we coordinate with the surrounding areas, uh, be it Dallas, Cedar Hill, Jasota, uh, or, uh, yeah, um, because it seems like they're, they'd be getting the same information you're getting, and so it also seems like there's a strong possibility they'd be setting their alarms off in, in the the, at the same time as we are. Is that, is that happening, or do you know? I do. I do. Uh, when it, type of storms are coming in, Cedar Hill will open up their EOC. I open up our EOC into a what they call level three monitoring, okay. and just and just uh, the same way. And we're on uh, radio contact or phone contact. And if one of us makes the decision, generally we'll look, make sure we don't have blue skies above us, all three of the cities will generally set it off at the same time. Okay. Uh, Dallas will set theirs off, and a lot of our citizens are hearing Dallas's uh, sirens being set off because you, they may have a storm coming through downtown. And the way I understand it, all their sirens sound at one time oh, really? throughout the whole city. So that's what we're probably hearing here in uh, our town is, is over to the west and to the north. We may be hearing uh, Dallas sirens. So, yeah, they do overlap. All right, thank you. One other system that we do have in the city, and I think there's some confusion about this system, because uh, our system is set off manually. Uh, somebody literally has to push the buttons to make these sirens go off. It, they, they won't go off accidentally, unless that's, some of y'all may have remembered years ago they got hacked. Uh, I think we've taken care of that little problem. So. Uh, Generally, there's very few people who set those sirens off. This system here is automatic. It uh, is a um, 
and seen six of our parks, the Armstrong, Alexander, Harrington, Lakeside, and Lions Park, along with Redbird. And these, what these things are, are light, lightning prediction uh, system. So they're in the parks, and what they do is they, re they read uh, your static charge that's in the air. And they can do that up to 15 miles away. And uh, if they read that there's enough and they detect a lightning strike within a two-mile radius of Duncanville, then these will go off automatically. And they'll sound a siren for 15 seconds. And there's a strobe light uh, affiliated with that, too. Once they do not receive the charge anymore and they haven't detected any uh, lightning in the area, then you'll hear three five-second horn blasts indicating that, um, you know, it's clear to go back out on the ball field or something and play uh, your baseball, softball, whatever you're playing. So uh, it's a very good system. Uh, it's reliable. And uh, I think that people mix these sirens up with our community alert sirens and these lightning detection. They're, but they're two separate things. One's automatic, one's manual. We'll look at our performance indicators, some of our calls. One I'd like to draw attention to is our EMS uh, calls for service. Uh, during this quarter, we had 1,265 uh, calls for service. So our EMS system runs probably about 69 to 74% of our total calls. So um, that's been increasing here over the last couple of years. We're kind of seeing it level off a little bit, but uh, we still have quite a bit of EMS calls in, in the city. And that's the end of my report. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mr. Coon. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for the, the updates. And I want to ask about staffing. So we have three three vacancies, right? Yes, sir. And how many, so on, on a, so they work 24-hour shifts, right? So on any given shift, how many uh, medics do we have and how many firefighters do we have on any given shift? Our minimum staffing is uh, five at each station with a what we call an incident commander or battalion chief. So generally we want to keep at least two uh, paramedics to be able to ride those ambulances, and we like to keep a paramedic on that fire apparatus. Reason for that is the um, ambulances can go on medical calls. If they're out of their district, what they'll do is they'll uh, dispatch a fire apparatus with another paramedic, and we call them paramedic engines. So they can go in there and they can initiate um, or start care until we can get another ambulance from uh, either another city or another one of our districts uh, to come in there and transport. Generally, we have four paramedics assigned per shift per station if they're not you know on vacation or sick or on a holiday yeah so just given given the demands on the, the department if we were to let's say we were to fill those three vacancies would would that be enough <laughs> I guess is what I'm, what I'm trying to ask uh, as far as meeting the demands on the on the department um, no okay uh, those three vacancies will get me just up the level uh, because I'm still going to have to send those three vacancies to paramedic school. So while they're going to paramedic school, I get nothing out of them while they're going to school. So I have to backfill with other paramedics uh, to ride it until they get out of school and come back in and they can count as staffing. But we're always short. Uh, we have vacancies all the time and we really need to increase our staffing uh, probably by about six to make sure that we have an effective staffing to you know, man the ambulances while other people are going to paramedic school or, or any other kind of training. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Contreras. Uh, we've never had a deputy fire marshal. Uh, we just had that position approved in October and we, uh, according to civil service rules, you got to give 90 days before you can test. Well, that was end of December, uh, beginning of January. Then we had a test, but nobody passed the test, so we had to wait an extended period of time to get another test scheduled. So 
we just had someone uh, pass that exam, and uh, we're going to promote him on the 24th of April. The amount of work that the fire marshal has to carry on his shoulders, um, this is huge that we got, got him this kind of qualified help, so thank you. Well, I thank the council because it's going to be a very important position. It allows my uh, fire marshal to go out and actually do his job, and uh, my deputy can go out and do inspections, and then if there's a reason why the fire marshal is out of town, then he can come up there and fill in so we're not ever out of a, a fire marshal. That's a, a very demanding position and a very position that we really do need. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And again, on behalf of our entire council, we are proud of our firefighters and our EMTs throughout the entire staff and our gratitude to all of them for what they do and being in the best city in, the, in Texas and having the best firefighter department with your leadership. We do appreciate that very much. And I will convey that to my guys. And I just want to say uh, that ditto to my assistant chief. Uh, I will let you guys know that I have the best assistant chief in Greg Ch Chase out of the three or four cities. Uh, now, that is my opinion, but I've got some facts that I use to prove that. So y'all can be proud that y'all have that assistant chief uh, that we do have. I don't want to embarrass him or anything, but. Uh, He's already done that by himself. Oh, is he? Yeah. I'm very, very <laughs> proud of him because he, he does an excellent job. He's very, very uh, sociable in the, in the community, and uh, he networks very well with our other um, cities. So uh, I, I'm proud to have him. And we are as well. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank, Thank you, you for all that you do. All right, folks. Uh, we, as I said earlier, we are creating item number seven. Item number seven is the executive session. I'll read that. City Council shall convene into a closed executive session to seek legal advice from the city attorney pursuant to section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code concerning the termination of former city manager potential or threatened litigation, if any, and action is necessary as a result of the executive session. There is no action to be taken as a result of executive session. That completes our business for tonight. With that, we stand adjourned at 8.32. Thank you.